doing time, punishment measured in months and years behind bars. It's a system so ingrained in our culture that it's hard to imagine the concept has only existed for scarcely more than 200 years. Sing Sing Prison was a pioneer in developing and testing this new method of punishment, and along the way, it became a model for penitentiaries throughout the world. But creating a prison system wasn't an easy task. The first years at Sing Sing were characterized by unimaginable brutality. The infamous bank robber, Willie Sutton, spent most of his adult life in and out of different penitentiaries. He called Sing Sing the most horrible prison he'd ever been in. Sing Sing earned its reputation by housing the toughest criminals from New York City. Its legend grew from the Hollywood movies filmed at the prison. Sing Sing gave birth to the terms Big House and Up the River. It was also where the phrase last mile was originated as more than 600 inmates were marched to Sing Sing's electric chair. Among them, crimes are Louis Lepke Buckalter and A-bomb spies Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Today, more than 170 years after it opened, Sing Sing remains one of the most notorious penitentiaries in the world. Jails have existed for centuries, but in the beginning, they were merely holding pens for criminals waiting to be tried or to receive their punishment. Living conditions in these dungeons were grim. Often there were no beds or bedding, no bathing facilities, and open sewers were commonplace. When it came time for punishment, the options were public humiliation, banishment, torture, or the gallows. For minor offenses, things like uh, women for gossiping would have a, a bit like a horse in their mouth, and then they'd be strapped to a long pole with a fulcrum and they'd be dunked in the river or a pond. Or if it was a little more serious, they'd have their ear nailed to a cart and be on exhibit for a day. Felons, when they were convicted, were sentenced not to serve in a, in a prison, not to give up their liberty for a set period of time, but were rather sentenced to suffer either capital punishment or corporal punishment Everything from uh, putting a person on the rack, to whipping them, to severing fingers, uh, mutilating them in other ways, cutting off ears, and so forth. This arbitrary system offered little leniency. Even for minor crimes, repeat offenders were simply hung. The system before the penitentiary is highly uneven. Um, it goes mild, 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 severe. Uh, or, uh, uh, if you will, uh, it's a system that doesn't have any middle range of punishment. Uh, you let them off with more or less a slap or you execute them. There's nothing in between. After the American Revolution, the United States took the lead in penal reform. The revolution is the key moment here in which Americans begin to identify the old corporal punishments with monarchy and England, and so they are about the business of inventing a new form of punishment that they think is appropriate to living in a republic. And slowly, the penitentiary comes into place with its commitment to reformation. The Pennsylvania Quakers were the first to implement prison sentences as punishment. In Philadelphia's Walnut Street Jail, they built a cell block with 16 individual cells. Here, inmates would serve their entire sentences locked in their cells, maintaining absolute silence. The reformers believed this extreme isolation, combined with labor and religious study, would return the sinners to their innate goodness. In 1797, 
New York State opened Newgate Prison in New York City, and later in 1815, Auburn Prison in the western part of the state. New York would try a different method of incarceration called the congregate or Auburn system. In their prisons, inmates would also be required to maintain silence. But during the day, they would be let out to work in factories with other inmates. Officials believed this method was more humane and hoped the workshops would be lucrative enough to make the prison self-supporting. By the 1820s, it was clear that Newgate would not be large enough to serve New York City's exploding population and crime rate. Construction of a large new prison was approved. A site was chosen near Ossining, New York, about 30 miles up the Hudson River from New York City, hence the term, up the river. The town and the prison both derived their names from the area's early inhabitants, the Sintzink Indians, whose name means stone on stone. The location chosen for the new prison was a rich marble quarry that would provide raw materials for construction as well as a profitable labor source for the future inmates. Captain Elam Linz was appointed to lead the project. In 1825, Captain Linz came down from Auburn. He was the, the warden at Auburn Prison, and he came down with 100 inmates uh, down the Erie Canal and down the Hudson River, and they came in here, set up temporary quarters, and then built this cell block. They quarried the stone from up in the hill, came down, and they built the cell block. It took them three years to complete four tiers of this cell block. So in, in 1828, they were finally finally finished. Today, only the shell remains of this mammoth cell block, 476 feet long, four tiers high, with over 800 cells. The design was similar to Auburn, with a freestanding cell block built within the walls of a secure building. It was believed that this structure would eliminate the need for a prison wall. Because men were only to be confined at night, each cell measured only seven feet deep by less than three and a half feet wide. There was no running water and only a bucket for a toilet. This same structure would serve as Sing Sing's primary cell block for more than 100 years. Willie Sutton served time in these grim quarters in 1926. He wrote, very little sunlight penetrated the block and the only ventilation was through the pattern of one inch square holes in the doors. The cell was so narrow you had to walk in sideways and the walls were made up of jagged rocks which were pointed like daggers. The block also included a new technical innovation, a locking system that allowed keepers to secure 50 cells at once. The facade of the building was also designed to play a role in the prison's philosophy. Sing Sing has a totally austere and blank facade, indicating that life inside is harsh and cold with no luxuries. There are also no obvious doors, reinforcing the notion that there is no exit from this prison. A penitentiary that would soon earn the name, the House of Fear. By the 1830s, Sing Sing's cell block was surrounded by workshops, factories, a chapel, a kitchen, and a hospital. And over 500 inmates were confined at the prison. Elam Linds became the first warden, and his administration set the tone for the prison's fearsome reputation. Linds had little faith in the ability of inmates to be reformed. He was a former army captain and felt that the only way to control the inmates in this congregate setting was through strict discipline. Linz encouraged his guards to inflict punishment and treat prisoners with contempt. He once said that he felt it was impossible to govern a large prison without a whip. <laughs> 
Sing Sing has the distinction of inventing the lockstep. The lockstep is a mix of march and shuffle. Their arms are extended, each one on the shoulder of the man in front of them, moving them in unison, and they are easily watched and guarded, and it's also supposed to be a kind of humbling sort of experience. They are, of course, wearing, and this is the first time it happens, they are wearing striped uniforms. Striped uniforms would quickly identify convicts if they escaped and were considered an additional way to humiliate prisoners. From the moment you entered Sing Sing, there was a notion and an effort to reshape your identity. You were given instructions about the governing principles of the institution, about behavior, and then your hair would be shaved. Some of the inmates' accounts talk about haircuts that seem to be deliberately disfiguring. You then are issued a set of stripes. Uh, they rarely fit you, and most egregiously, you're given a pair of shoes which uh, do not fit you. This becomes a very difficult moment because in the next three days, you're gonna learn how to do the lockstep. Now imagine doing that with a pair of ill-fitting shoes. Uh, the pain of this got so grievous that we know men attempted suicide within the first week of Sing Sing. Like the rival system in Pennsylvania, the congregate system demanded absolute silence. The Quakers felt it would lead to reformation, but at Sing Sing, it was used for control. Silence is the advantage of the keeper versus the inmate. Communication allows the inmate to conspire. In conspiring, he creates the connections that make up the prison subculture. If I can prevent him from communicating, I could break the back of that subculture, and then I have the upper hand. Punishment for violating the rules was swift and severe. The most common infraction was breaking the rule of silence. The whip, or cat or nine tails, was the favorite method of punishment. Linz preferred a cat with six wire-tipped leather strips. Levi Burr was an inmate at the prison in the 1830s and wrote an account of his brutal experience. Burr described the harsh government of Sing Sing as a catocracy and wrote about a lashing a fellow inmate received. Two cats were flailing the skin off the body and the affected subject was begging upon his knees and crying and twisting under the lacerating that tore his skin from his back. Uh, the punishments are inflicted in a central hall. Uh, the sound of the inmate screaming can be heard by other inmates. That's done intentionally. The blood that is spilled from these punishments uh, is left in place on the floor as a warning to other inmates. In 1848, flogging was outlawed, so keepers invented creative new ways to discipline inmates. The iron cage was often administered where the rule breaker was forced to keep the painful cage on his head 24 hours a day. The most frequent punishment was the shower bath. This torture was administered in two ways. One was to place a collar around the inmate's neck and then slowly fill it with water. Eventually, the water covers the mouth and nose, creating the sensation of drowning. The other version was simply to dump a tremendous quantity of cold water on the convict's head. The nature of the infraction determined the volume of water. The shower bath was a highly desirable punishment because it left no disfiguring marks. By the 1880s, the principal form of punishment became the darkened cell, a cramped dungeon with no light, no food, and no water. Time in the cell would be determined by the severity of the infraction. In 1839, Sing Sing built a women's prison on the hill above the main cell block. Conditions were just as bad for female inmates. However, in 1845, Eliza Farnham took over as matron and tried to reform both the women's and the men's prison. She was an advocate of phrenology, a pseudoscience of the day that theorized criminal behavior was caused by underdeveloped areas of the brain. In 
Phrenologists believed that by studying the bumps on the head, they could identify criminals. Farnham felt that physical punishment only stimulated these negative areas of the brain, and rehabilitation was the most effective approach. She brings a piano, and all of a sudden there's music inside the woman's penitentiary. On July 4th, she insists that the principal inspector send every woman in the women's prison a rose. All of those rigid disciplines are relaxed under her governance. And the outsiders really thought of this as the work of a woman who had really gone over the edge. Farnham lobbied for this same humane treatment for the men. But by 1848, outrage over her liberal policies forced her resignation. Sing Sing's women's prison was closed altogether in 1877. Also, in 1877, a prison wall was finally built. It was designed to prevent escapes, but it was also added in the hope of reducing the level of control needed by the jailers. The American penitentiary system and Sing Sing became a fascination. Curiosity seekers made the prison a popular tourist attraction with some 1,500 people a year making the trek from New York City. For 25 cents, visitors could watch the inmates through specially constructed peepholes, an activity referred to as the pornography of the 19th century. But the American prisons were also studied by serious scholars from around the world many of whom were considering instituting a penitentiary system in their own countries. This was not an embarrassment. We were proud of these prisons. We thought that we were doing something that everybody should emu emulate. And in fact, uh, we set off a spark of change. Uh, we become known as the center of the innovation that is the prison. Pennsylvania and New York became fierce rivals, each vying to have their system adopted. Sing Sing's inmate labor was attractive because of the income it generated. But Pennsylvania claimed New York's brutal system eliminated all hope of rehabilitation. Ultimately, economics won out and Sing Sing's congregate system became the worldwide standard for 19th century penitentiaries. Gradually, reform began to take effect at Sing Sing. Originally, there were no visits or letters permitted. By the 1880s, inmates were allowed one visit every two months and one letter a month. For the first time, inmates were issued a camphene lamp for reading in their cells at night. The 20th century brought an entirely new approach to the treatment of prisoners. Brutality was curbed, and striped uniforms were a thing of the past. The idea now was that the granting of privileges was more conducive to discipline than brutality. On December 6th, 1914, Thomas Mott Osborne became Sing Sing's warden, ushering in a new enlightened era to the institution. Osborne had earned his reputation as a reformer at Auburn Prison. He had disguised himself as an inmate and lived inside the walls for a week. This experience inspired Osborne to conclude, every inmate must have the most practical amount of individual freedom because it is liberty alone that fits a man for liberty. One of his philosophies was that for inmates to stop coming to jail, to prisons, they had to take responsibilities for themselves. And he, he looked for ways in the prison system to help inmates take on this responsibility. One of the things he developed was something called a mutual welfare league. An inmate governed body, which was totally unheard of at the time, and is, and is actually unheard of even today, where the inmates would form a court of such. They would even met out discipline to other inmates. They got other inmates involved in sporting activities. They had a commissary way back 